Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. This is another in this occasional series of readings from and brief notes and commentary upon Eusebius of Caesarea's The Ecclesiastical History. Here is Book 7 and Chapter 24. Besides all these, the two treatises on promises were also composed by him. The occasion was supplied him by the teaching of Nepos, a bishop of those in Egypt, that the promises which had been made to the saints and the divine scriptures should be interpreted more after a Jewish fashion, and his assumption that there will be a kind of millennium on this earth devoted to bodily indulgence. Thinking, for example, to establish his own peculiar opinion from the Apocalypse of John, he composed a certain book on the subject and entitled it Refutation of the Allegorists. Dionysius attacked him in the books on promises, in the first of which he sets out the view that he himself held with regard to the doctrine, and in the second treats of the Apocalypse of John. There, at the beginning, he mentions Nepos, writing as follows about him. But since they bring forward a certain composition of Nepos, on which they rely greatly as proving indisputably that the kingdom of Christ will be on earth, let me say that in many other respects I approve and love Nepos for his faith and devotion to work, his diligent study of the scriptures, and his abundant psalmody, by which many of the brethren have till this day been cheered, and I am full of respectful regard for the man, all the more for that he has gone to his rest already. But truth is dear, and to be honored above all things, and one must give ungrudging praise and assent to whatever is stated rightly, but examine and correct whatever appears to be unsoundly written. And if he were present and putting forward his opinions merely in words, conversation, without writing— would be sufficient, persuading and instructing by question and answer them that oppose themselves. But when a book is published, which some think most convincing, and when certain teachers who consider the law and the prophets of no value and disregard the following of the Gospels and depreciate the epistles of the apostles, yet make promises concerning the teaching of this treatise as if it were some great and hidden mystery, and do not suffer the simpler of our brethren to have high and noble thoughts, either about the glorious and truly divine appearing of our Lord, or of our resurrection from the dead and our gathering together and being made like unto him, but persuade them to hope for what is petty and mortal, and like the present in the kingdom of God, then we also are compelled to argue with Nepos, our brother, as if he were present." After other remarks, he adds as follows. Now, when I came to the gnome of Arsinoe, where, as thou knowest, this doctrine has long been prevalent, so that schisms and defections of whole churches had taken place, I called together the presbyters and teachers of the brethren in the villages. There were present also such of the brethren as wished. And I urged them to hold the examination of the question publicly, and when they brought me this book as some invincible weapon and rampart, I sat with them, and for three successive days, from morn till night, attempted to correct what had been written. On that occasion, I conceived the greatest admiration for the brethren, their firmness, love of truth, facility in following an argument, and intelligence. As we propounded in order and with forbearance the questions, the difficulties raised, and the points of agreement. On the one hand, refusing to cling obstinately, and at all costs, even though they were manifestly wrong, to opinions once held. And on the other hand, not shirking the counter-arguments, but, as far as possible, attempting to grapple with the questions in hand and master them. Nor, if Convinced by reason, were we ashamed to change our opinions and give our assent. But conscientiously and unfeignedly, and with hearts laid open to God, we accepted whatever was established by the proofs and teachings of the Holy Scriptures. And in the end, the leader and introducer of this teaching, Karasion, as he was called, in the hearing of all the brethren present, 
assented and testified to us that he would no longer adhere to it, nor discourse upon it, nor mention, nor teach it, since he had been sufficiently convinced by the contrary arguments. And as to the rest of the brethren, some rejoiced at the joint conference and the mutual deference and unanimity which all displayed. Here ends book seven and chapter 24, and we'll move on to some notes and commentary. This chapter discusses uh, two treatises titled On Promises that were written by Dionysius of Alexandria in reply to the teaching of an Egyptian bishop named Nepos. Nepos is described as having advocated a more literal form of scriptural interpretation after a more Jewish fashion. For the book of Revelation in particular, he taught that there would be a literal millennium on earth. Nepos's book, no longer extant, was titled Refutation of the Allegorists. In the first book in On Promises, Dionysius says that uh, he, or Eusebius says that Dionysius dealt with interpretation. And in the second part of On Promises, or the second book, he dealt with the Apocalypse of John or the book of Revelation. Dionysius uh, apparently first expressed his respect for Nepos, who at the time he wrote, uh, Nepos was already deceased. And so Dionysius is quoted by Eusebius from this work, again, praising Nepos for his faith, his devotion, his diligence in scripture study. But uh, after praising him, he says that he must nevertheless, uh, because of his love for the truth, um, expose the errors and mistakes that were found in Nepos's thought and in his book in particular. He says if he had just taught orally, that would be one thing, but he put these ideas down in a book, and so it needed to be uh, publicly responded to. He also notes, uh, through the citation from Dionysius, a meeting that was held in the Nome or division or area of Egypt known as Arsinoe, uh, a place where apparently there had been schisms and defections of whole churches over a conflict regarding Nepos's teachings. Dionysius says that he called together the brethren, uh, the presbyters and the teachers, and they discussed these matters for three straight days, conversing day and night. Uh, in the end, the leader of this movement, a man named Carassion, uh, Dionysius says, was convinced by the contrary arguments and by the scriptural arguments that were made and rejected publicly uh, the teaching of Nepos. And so this brings this chapter to a close. In conclusion, we can say this chapter highlights early disputes uh, in Egypt and the area around Alexandria in particular, relating to the teaching of this person, Nepos, over both the proper interpretation of Scripture and the proper interpretation of the book of Revelation, and particularly the idea that was put forward of a millennium. Uh, Dionysius rejects both an overly literal interpretive method and a literal interpretation of the millennium. Uh, he sees his task as... Uh, a bishop to correct errors in teaching and to restore unity among the churches. Uh, this chapter illustrates the controversial nature of scriptural interpretation and especially the interpretation of the book of Revelation among early Christians. And we can see perhaps why uh, Eusebius has said earlier in the book that some were disputing the canonicity of Revelation since there were disputes about it. Of course, another great focus of this chapter is on the Catholicity with a small c or the unity of the church in its doctrine and teaching. Well, this brings this episode to a conclusion. Hope that this has been helpful and edifying for those who are listening. And we'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.